there are three components into us. If you have good character, then the other two may come. Your character is of your own making. Your character is of your own choice. As you live life, you are the author of your own life. So the investment must go into character. And the rest may or may not come. There are six essential components as we are developing our character. And they all start with the letter C. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. We welcome our brothers and sisters. We have Brother Yasser Fazaga. He would be speaking on a very vital issue in terms of morality before all of us. Brother Yasser, armed with a bachelor's degree in Islamic studies from Imam Saud University Institute of Islamic and Arabic Sciences in Virginia, USA, a master's degree in psychotherapy from the California State University of Long Beach and presently doing his master's in theology at Loyola Marymount University, USA, as well as serving as the Imam, that's a religious leader of the Orange County Islamic Foundation in Mission Vijo, California. His sharp intellect and insightful analysis on current issues make him an inspiring guide and motivator for his avid audiences worldwide. He is a therapist at FACES, where he helps families with different challenges in life, which include domestic violence issues, communication problems, marital matters, generational gap, difficult teens, some mental and personality disorders, divorce, grief, and single parenting, among others. Brother Yasser Fazaga's talks and interviews about Islam and related issues are popular on television, news stations, and radio stations around the globe. A very knowledgeable, humanistic, and experienced speaker for the topic of the day, the six C's of character. Brothers and sisters, let's welcome Brother Yasser Fazaga. <laughs> والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي All praise is due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to all the brothers and sisters out there Muslim brothers in faith and my brothers who may not be of the Muslim faith my brothers and sisters in humanity I begin by greeting with the greetings of Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It must be known that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught many things. But if anything stands of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught to individuals, it is the idea of character. Having a proper and good character. And before we dodge into this, please allow me a few minutes to take you on a very short journey as to what the teachings of Islam ought to be like. Brothers and sisters, Islam is about a set of beliefs. These beliefs must manifest themselves in a set of rituals. These rituals must have an impact of the character of the individual. The character of the individual manifests itself when we deal with other people. So it's a circle that is made of these four important vital components. A set of beliefs, you must practice them in a set of rituals. These rituals must impact your behavior and your character, and your character is shown as you deal with other people. And by the way, any missing link in this chain is not acceptable. A person may have good ibadah, but they have no good akhlaq. And that is the case nowadays. With Muslims, you have people who are excellent when it comes to rituals doing. But they're very rude. 
They're very loud and they're just not pleasant to be around. And then you have another group of people, they're very nice, they're very calm, it's easy to get along with them. However, they have no proper relationship with Allah. Who's better? For a person to have what seems to be a good relationship with his creator, but has a terrible relationship with creation, or somebody who gets along well with creation, but has no proper relationship with the creator, who's better? This is like we asking, which one do you want me to take away from you? Your right eye or your left eye? I would say neither. So similarly, we cannot say that I have a proper relationship with Allah, but I don't care about people. It does not work out that way. And that is why this link is very important. Nothing within it can be missing. But the Quran tells us the following. If you have, if you have, and listen to this carefully, if you have excellent ibadah, but terrible akhlaq, terrible manners, terrible character, your ibadah will not make up for the deficiency in your character. This is a very important point. If you have good ibadah, meaning that you do your rituals, you fulfill your rituals, but you have got a terrible character, your good ibadah, your numerous and abundance ibadah will not make up for the deficiency in your akhlaq, in your character. However, if you have excellent akhlaq and decent ibadah, your excellent akhlaq may make up for the deficiency in your ibadah. Somebody says, I need proof for this. We must have proof for this. This is a big statement. What is the proof of it? In the hadith, it said that the Prophet wasallam was informed about two women. One woman, they said, she prayed a lot, she fasted a lot, she did all her extra voluntary acts of worship, but she was extremely rude to her neighbors. The Prophet wasallam said, if she continues in this lifestyle, her final abode shall be the hellfire. And then he was told, oh, Prophet of Allah, there is another woman. She does not pray much, she does not fast much, but she only fulfills her obligations. She is excellent and good when it comes to her neighbors. The Prophet wasallam said, if she continues that route, her abode in the hereafter shall be heaven. From this hadith, the Prophet wasallam is telling us, having enough ibadah, with excellent akhlaq, that would lead you to paradise. But never think that because you have abundance of ibadah, that is going to determine your abode in the hereafter. This is such a crucial point that we must understand well. And also, it was the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam would tell people, أَقْرَبُكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةَ أَحَاسِنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا That those of you who are going to be closest in position to me in the day of judgment, are those of you who possess the best of characters. This is not really say about praying much and fasting much. And by the way, we are not undermining too much prayers or too much fasting. This is not what we're talking about. But as we said last night, it is an idea about priority and being mature in our relationship with Allah and our relationship with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, because of your akhlaq, because of your character, he said, Inna ahadakum, la yudriku al-qa'im, that one of you is able to be equal in position with somebody who is constantly praying at night, with somebody who is constantly fasting during the day, due to his good character. If you have good character, he said, you are able to reach that rank. And also finally in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is approached by a man when he came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, awsini. O Messenger of Allah, give me an advice. And the Prophet said, He said, be mindful of Allah wherever you may be. And then he said, after any bad deed, poor choice, do something that is good and that will wipe it away. And then he said, and deal with people in the best of manners. Have a good character. See, brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, there are three components into us. There is our reputation, there is our personality, and then there is our character. Our reputation is what people think of us. 
And what happens is that most people invest most of our effort in perfecting our reputation. Why? Because the effort is very little and the reward is immediate. All you have to do is just watch a politician. Around elections times, what do they do? They want to seem to people that they are kind, so they hold an orphan baby and they take a picture and if it makes it to the headlines and the first page, they made it. They are selling an image about themselves. Watch politicians around the time of elections. And you will see them pouring so much money in improving and selling their reputation. So our reputation is what people think of us. And then there is our personality. And our personality is how we present ourselves to people. How you present yourself to people. And also, we do spend effort and we invest money and time on improving our personality simply because the reward is also immediate and the effort is not much. So nowadays, for example, we have uh, personality enhancement classes. We have enhancement of your smile. Let us whiten your teeth for you. Nothing wrong with that. But the point is you are about to sell an image for yourself as well. You are telling people what you seem to be. Not who you really are, but what you seem to be. And then there is our character. And our character is who we really are. So reputation is what people think of us. Personality is what we seem to be. And character is who we really are. And most do not invest enough in character. We like to invest more on reputation and invest more on personality, but not on character. And sadly, it is the character that really defines us. And subhanallah, glory be to Allah, if you have good character, then the other two may come. So having good character, the reward may not be immediate. In fact, many times, people with good character may go unnoticed. In fact, many times, your good character may be a problem for you in this life because you like to deal with people with clarity, you like to deal with honesty, but everybody around you is a cheater. So your goodness, your honesty becomes a problem for you. So people say, what the heck was the character? Who cares? All people around me cheat. So we stop investing on our character because investing in the character becomes very problematic. But subhanallah, listen to this and listen carefully. Our reputation, people can ruin. Our character, we only can ruin. People can ruin your reputation if they want to, and you have absolutely no control over this. But when it comes to your character, you are in full control over your character. Nobody can ruin your character. Your character is of your own making. Your character is of your own choice. As you live life, you are the author of your own life. So character is our choice. Reputation, people may or may not harm it. But character, we only can harm. Reputation is the camouflage. Character is the real thing. Reputation is what everybody thinks. Character is who we really are. So the investment must go into character. It must go into character. And the rest may or may not come. If they come, alhamdulillah. If they don't come, I have good character at any case. But the question is, two questions. What is character and how do you get good character? What is our character? They say that our character is the set of words, actions, and habits that we display. It is the set of words and habits and actions that we display. That is why they say, watch your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Watch your words. Your words become your actions. Watch your actions. Your actions become your habits. Watch your habits. Your habits formulate your character and your character becomes your destiny. Watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habit. Watch your habit. They formulate your character and character determines your destiny. And that is why from the very beginning, the Prophet ﷺ would teach along all these lines, watch your thoughts. Now somebody say, what do you mean watch my thoughts? I cannot control my thoughts. And we say, yes, you are right. We do not control the thoughts that come into our mind, 
but we control the thoughts that we dwell in. This is important. We do not control the thoughts that come to our mind, but we control the thoughts that we choose to dwell in. So be careful about which thoughts do you dwell in most. And then the Prophet of course, would speak about watch your words and all these things and watch your habits and watch your actions that is a given. But then what are the essential components of having a good character? There are six essential components as we are developing our character. And by the way, remember this. Having a good character is not a goal. Having a good character is a process. What is the difference? Anytime we mix our goals with our means, we become stagnant. That is a recipe for disaster. When we mix and confuse our goals with our means, that is a recipe for disaster. For example, building a mosque, is that a goal or is it a mean? What is it? Is it a goal or is it a mean? It's a mean. So what happens is that if we think that our goal is to build a masjid, so okay, we build a masjid, and then what? Nothing. We already achieved our goal. So you become very stagnant. Is giving zakah a goal or a mean? It's a mean in order to eliminate poverty. Is fasting Ramadan in itself, is that a goal or a mean? It's a mean so that you become a better person. Performing salah, is that a goal or a mean? There are means so that you become a more purified individual. Going to hajj, is that a goal or a mean? Some people say, I am saving money because I am going to hajj. Why are you saving money? My goal is to go to hajj. Hajj is not a goal, but rather hajj should be a means. Some people go to hajj and they come back. And you ask them, how was hajj? And they tell you, hajj was beautiful. So many people, it was crowded and I saw people from all walks of life. I saw the blacks and I saw the whites, I saw the browns and I saw the yellows and I saw... They come back from Hajj and they're still racist. They've been to Hajj, they saw the blacks, they saw the whites and they come back and they're still racist. What good was the Hajj for you? What good was it? They go to Hajj and they come back and you ask them, so what was the most difficult part of Hajj? They tell you, man, going between Safa and Marwa was very difficult. They go to Hajj and they, and they come back and they're still a chauvinist. The most difficult part in Hajj, you are imitating a woman. You are commemorating what Hajr alayhi salam did. Hajr alayhi salam did. You go and you come back and you go and you're imitating a woman. You come back and you're still a chauvinist. You go and you come back, you're still racist. And then you say, Hajj was great. So that is not acceptable. And part of it is because we have confused our means and our goals. When you set anything as a means, it becomes a process, such as having good character. It's a process. And because it's a process, you can never say, I have good character. What it is, is that there is always a room for improvement. You can always become a better person. It takes dedication into the process so that you are constantly working on your character. So what are the essential components of having a good character? Six essential components. And they all start with the letter C. And the reason why we do it, it's just easier to memorize this way. So what are these six essential characters or qualities that all start with the letter C? The first one is conscience, or damir, as we would say in Arabic. Conscience. What is conscience? Conscience is the inner moral compass that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Everybody Allah has given us a moral compass inside by which we are able to feel the right from the wrong. By which we are able sometimes to tell the right from the wrong. And sometimes we speak about people and they say, and we say, have they no conscience? How can they do this? Don't they have a heart? Does their soul not speak to them? What happened to that conscience? And the Prophet ﷺ gives the most beautiful examples to this. In the hadith, Wasib ibn Ma'bad, one time in the evening, he's thinking to himself and he said, tomorrow morning after Fajr, I am going to the Prophet ﷺ and I am going to ask Prophet of Allah, what is sin and what is righteousness? Al-Bir wal -ithn. He said, I am so determined that tomorrow morning, I will ask the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa about righteousness and about sin. 
He said, the next morning I went to the masjid. He said, when I got to the masjid, I was late. And the masjid was packed. And I could not reach to the Prophet He said, I saw him and he saw me and he smiled. He said, so I started pushing people to the side to walk towards the Prophet And people were pulling me down saying, Wasiba, you came in late. You cannot go to the front. And I said, no, I want to talk to Muhammad Sallallahu I want the messenger of Allah. And he said, when the Prophet smiled, he said, that encouraged me to go on, even though I was pushing people to the left and to the right. He said, and I went there. And I sat next to the Prophet of Allah. He said, I was so close sitting down to him that my knees were touching on his knees. And my hands were placed on his thighs, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said to me, Oh Wasiba, if you want, I can answer your question before you ask it. And if you want, I can wait for you to ask your question and then I will answer it. Wasiba ibn Ma'bad said, No Prophet of Allah, I want you to answer my question before I ask it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wasiba, you are here to inquire from me. What is righteousness and what is sin? And Wasiba said, I was amazed. I said, Prophet of Allah, this is exactly what I am here for. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, al birru husnul khuluq. He said, righteousness is about having good character. And then he said, well, if as for sin, ma haka fi sadrika wa khashita an yattali'a alayhi nas. He said, sin is that which pricks into your heart and you do not want it to be exposed to people. The beauty of the statement is sin is that which pricks in your heart. It doesn't feel good. It does not feel good. You can feel it. You can sense it. And sometimes when we listen to this voice, that moral compass in our head, then we are on good direction. But sometimes we have that inner voice calling upon us. This is wrong. You should not be doing this and we ignore it. Next time it will call upon us, but we lose hearing of it. So it comes to the point that we become desynthesized. We do not listen to the calls of the inner voice that is in us. And that is why the Prophet Wasallam, in one hadith, he is describing the idea of a sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path. He said, as you are taking your journey in life, into this straight path, he said there will be people calling you from the sides. And they wanting to take you out of this straight path. He said, ignore them. And then he said, on the way, he said, he said there will be a caller that tells you to remain on this path. And then the Prophet ﷺ comments on this and he says, and this is guidance or admonisher from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he places in the heart of every believer. And the Prophet ﷺ sometimes would address this idea. For example, he would say, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ بَاتَ شَبْعَانًا وَجَارُهُ جَائِعْ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمْ He said, he is not of us. He who sleeps with a full belly, and his neighbor sleeps with an empty belly, and he knows about it, and he doesn't do anything about it. Say, have you no conscience? You go to bed with a full belly? You know that your neighbor is going to bed with an empty belly with his children. And there is something that you can do about it. And you don't do anything about it. Have you no conscience? Is your conscience dead? So the Prophet ﷺ would say, you are not even one of us. You cannot really claim to be of the community of the believers. Not acceptable. So the first sea, brothers and sisters, is the sea of conscience. Must listen to your conscience. One time, this man works as an accountant in his company. And as an accountant, you have access to the finances of the company. And sometimes if you play a little bit with the numbers, you know, you may end up getting something. You can end up doing something to yourself. So this accountant was once approached by a man. And he explained a process to him by which the accountant will make money but technically he will not be at fault. You can make the money and technically you are not at fault. So he said, I will think about it. He went home and he is thinking, technically I am not wrong, but I am feeling this way about it. And then his mother came. And he said, mother, I would like to consult you about this thing. And he explained the process to her. 
And he said, mom, I do this and I do that. And then by the end, I will make the money. But technically, I am not at fault. Nobody can fault me. Technically, no problem. The mother said, son, I really did not understand much of what you said. With all these numbers and all these complicated terms, she said, I just don't understand it. But I will be very troubled on the day when my son tries to go to sleep, but he is unable to go to sleep because something is bothering his conscience. Said, if you go to bed and you cannot make it to sleep because something is bothering you, she said, that day I will be very concerned for your well-being. The point is, be your own policeman. Many times we can be technically right, but ethically wrong. We can be technically right, but it does not look good. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you define sin from now on. If you have a living conscience, you are good enough to define what sin is. Because sin from now on is that which pricks into your heart and you do not want it exposed to people. You do not want it exposed to people. Usually we try to hide things that we are ashamed of. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the minute you feel this way, that you have got something pricking into your heart, and you are ashamed of having it exposed, he say, pay attention. What you are doing is not right. That is the first C. That is conscience. The second component of having a good character is compassion. Our ability to feel for others. Our ability to feel with others. Our ability to feel for the pain of those who are around us. And subhanAllah, sometimes you look into the world, we say that these people have no conscience, and then we say these people have no rahmah in their heart, they have no compassion into their heart. How can they allow things like this to go on? And many times, by the way, the problems that we see in the world, the poverty that is going on in the world, the starvation that happens in the world, it is not because of lack of resources. There is so much resources in the world. Throughout history of mankind, no time was food production ever as much as we have it nowadays. It is not that the earth cannot cater to our need, but the earth cannot cater to our greed. There is a lot of resources. But there is not enough compassion. Let me give you an example. The three richest people in the world have more money than the 48 poorest countries in the world combined. Three rich people have more money than 48 poor countries, the poorest countries in the world po combined. Put them together and these three rich people have more money than these 48 countries. So what happened to the Rahmah? What happened to the compassion? Where has it gone? And that is why the Prophet ﷺ would speak about this idea of Rahmah. As a believer, you must be a Rahmah for those who are around you. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahmanu yawm al-Qiyamah. Those who are compassionate in this world, Allah will be compassionate towards them in the hereafter. Don't we all the time say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah the compassionate, the most merciful, so what good is it that we know Allah to be compassionate, but we, we ourselves at a human level do not become an embodiment of that compassion. And that is why we see in the hadith and in the life of the Prophet wasallam, he was the most compassionate. But see brothers and sisters, it is easy to be compassionate to those who deserve it. It's easy to have your heart moved by somebody who is sick, by somebody who is poor, by somebody who is in need, it's easy to have your heart moved by this. And remember, being kind to those who are kind to you does not make you kind. And being good to those who are good to you does not make you good either. Real compassion is when it is least expected. For example, one time Ibn Umar goes to the market after the death of the Prophet and as he is in the market, he chooses the things that he wanted to buy, some vegetables, some fruits, and he puts it in his bag, and he puts his hands in his pockets, and he's about to get the money out to give it to the guy, and it turned out that somebody has stolen the money of Ibn Umar. So he looked into the guy that is in charge of the produce section selling him, he said, I am sorry, I think my money has been stolen. So the man calls upon the people in the market, Ya Ahl al 
He said, all people in the market. Inna ibn Umar qad suriq. He said that Ibn Umar is being robbed. He said Ibn Umar has been robbed. Fad'u ala sariqihi. So call Allah upon to destroy the person that robbed Ibn Umar of his wealth and of his money. So everybody raises his hands. Oh Allah, the thief that stole the money of Ibn Umar. Oh Allah, curse him. Oh Allah, do this to him. And then Ibn Umar raises his hands. And what does he say? He raises his hands. So now everybody is listening. What is Ibn Umar going to pray for? He raised his hands and he said, Allahumma in kana muhtajan, fabarik lahu fima akhad. He said, Oh Allah, if this person took it because he was in need, Oh Allah, bless this money for him. Allahumma wa in kana sariqan, fajalha akhira dhunubi. He said, Oh Allah, if he is a professional thief, Oh Allah, make this one the last of his sins. He said, Make it the last of his sins. Not going to gain anything. But see, it's very easy to be kind to those who are kind to you. Real compassion is when you show it to those who do not necessarily deserve it. That is compassion. And in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, here are the people of Mecca after the conquest of Mecca. And these are the people that tortured and persecuted and embargoed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. And everybody is present in front of him. And he says, what do you think I should do to you people of Mecca? What do you think I should do to you? You knowing fully well and you are very aware of what it is that you have done to me and to my companions. And the people of Mecca, they make a plea. Akhun Kareem, Wabnu Akhun Kareem. Indeed a noble man, the son of a noble man. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Idhabu fa antum talaqa He said, go, you are all free to go. You're all free to go. Why is this? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was indeed a compassionate man. And having a good character, it also means that you are able to feel for others and you are able to feel with others. You know, one time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came and um, two stories actually, one of them is that when his son died, the Prophet Sallallahu was crying. His son died. So he was crying. And then one man came to him and he saw tears coming down the cheeks of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Ma hadha ya Rasulullah? He said, what is this Prophet of Allah? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, it is mercy that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala places in the heart of the believers. The man was surprised, why is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, how can you be surprised? This is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala places in the hearts of the believers. Do not be surprised about it. You have got the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, some young boy came, Hassan Hussein, they came in and he started kissing them and he started playing with them. And this man was sitting next to him and he said, what are you doing? He said, I have 10 children. I have not kissed a single one of them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَا أَفْعَلُ لَكْ إِنْ كَانَتْ قَدْ نُزِعَتِ الرَّحْمَةُ مِنْ قَلْبِ He said, what can I do to you? If mercy has been snatched away from, from your heart. So there is so much need for compassion in our world today. And the Muslims are to take the lead into this because our messenger was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have conscience, we have compassion, and now we have consideration. Being considerate. What does that mean? It means that you are deliberate. You think before you act and before you speak, how is my action and how are my words going to impact those who are around me? Is it going to bring them up? Or is it going to crush their spirits? Is what I am about to say something nice that I need to share with people and it will be pleasing for them to hear it? Or is it going to crush their spirits and bring them down? So being considerate, the ability to think before you act, the ability to be deliberate about your words and about your actions. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ gave the most beautiful of examples in this. You know, one time the Prophet, peace be upon him, after the conquest of Mecca, some people decided to run away because they felt that if Muhammad Sallallahu gets a hold of us, we are dead. They didn't know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, if he gets a hold of us, we are dead. So one of the people that fled away was Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl. The son of Abu Jahl, that notorious enemy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his son, not a Muslim, he ran away. He said, I cannot be here. I am the son of Abu Jahl. I am Akrimah and Muhammad is coming to town. I better get out of town. So he ran out of town. 
The wife of Ikrima, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she accepted Islam. But then she still loves her husband. So she said, Prophet of Allah, what about my husband? What about him? What is his fate? What are you going to do about him? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we have granted him amnesty. He's welcome to come. He can live in Mecca. He doesn't have to accept Islam. He can come. She said, Prophet of Allah, I will tell him, but he will not believe me. He thinks I, he will think that I will be tricking him to bring him to you. So the Prophet ﷺ took off his turban and he gave it to her and he said, show him this. Now in the Arab culture, to do that, that is the ultimate sign of, I have granted you full amnesty. So she goes to her husband and she said, Ikrima, the Prophet ﷺ has granted you amnesty, come with me. He said, I don't believe you. You are only tricking me to take me back to Muhammad Sallallahu so that he may kill me. She said, Ikrimah, that is not the case. Look, here is the turban of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He saw this and he found out that he's being granted amnesty. So he is coming back. And the Prophet Sallallahu is sitting with his companions. And at a distance, he sees Ikrimah with his wife coming in. And the Prophet Sallallahu tells his companions, Hatha Ikrimah he said, this is Ikrimah. He is coming to you. And I know it that he is about to accept Islam. So please do not mention his father Abu Jahal with any ill words. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, for cursing those who are dead, they won't hear you. You can curse the dead all you want. He said, they won't hear you. But these words will affect those who are alive. Meaning that even though his father was a bad man, but still that was his father. He said, despite of what he has done to me, do not mention his father with any ill words. Be considerate. And as Muslims, we ought to be considerate, brothers and sisters. You know the Prophet ﷺ, one of the most beautiful aspects of him, is when he, when he would speak about respecting people's feelings. Respect people's feelings. Respect how your words and your actions is going to, what kind of impact it will have on them. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, if there are three people, two people should not be whispering to one another. Why? He said, because it will hurt the third person who is present. Respect the feelings of that present. Be considerate about it. The Prophet ﷺ said, when you lead people into salah, when you lead them into salah, he said, make sure that you shorten your prayers. Do not do it long, long, long prayers. He said, don't do that. Why? The Prophet ﷺ explains, he said, amongst those who are praying behind you are the young. Young children, you know, their attention span is not really that long. And then he said, and amongst them are the old. Standing up for them is not easy. And he said, and amongst them are those who are sick. And amongst them are those who are busy. He said, amongst them are those who are young. Amongst them are those who are sick. Amongst them are those who are old. And amongst them are those who are busy. Be considerate. Be considerate. The Prophet ﷺ is praying and during the salah, he hears a young kid, a young boy crying. So the Prophet ﷺ expedites the salah in a very noticeable way. And the people notice that the Prophet ﷺ is really, really praying very fast. So after the salah, they said, Prophet of Allah, what happened? The Prophet ﷺ said, I heard a child crying. And I knew that his mother would want to attend to him. And I knew how worried she would be about him. So I wanted to finish the salah as soon as possible so that she can attend to the baby. What would we do today if a child starts crying in the salah? After the salah, who is the father of this baby? Don't bring your children. Kill that baby anyway. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. The point is to be considerate. Sometimes we can, subhanallah, do things that are not very, that are not very acceptable. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that one of you should not be like a beast where he hits his wife during the day and then he expects to sleep with her at night. Not acceptable. That is not considerate. That is so unbelievably inconsiderate of any person. He beats her up during the day and then he wants to sleep with her at night. And the description that the Prophet ﷺ gave to such kind of a person, he said, do not be like a beast. 
Because such kind of a behavior is only befitting to a beast. And if you do it, the Prophet ﷺ said, you are imitating a beast. Not only this, and this may be a bit um, sensitive. But you know the Prophet ﷺ said, addressing men, he said, do not be like beasts. Where you come and you have an intimate relationship with your wife and you have your own desires fulfilled, but you are so inconsiderate whether your wife has received the same fulfillment or not. The Prophet ﷺ would say, be considerate. Intimacy is something that is supposed to be enjoyed by two people. So he said, do not be selfish in the process where you only enjoy yourself, but you are so disregardful of what happens to the other person. And the same description was given the, by the Prophet sallallahu He said it is part of weakness that a man would actually come and do this with his wife where he has his own desires fulfilled, but he does not care whether she has received the same or not. So the Prophet would say, be considerate. And I know that some brothers, they like to joke with their wives about the second wife. Every now and then it's a joke about the second wife. And we think it's funny. And every now, oh, you know, I'm going to get me a second wife. And we laugh about it. And she is telling you that it's not funny. Remember this brothers and sisters. If the other person is not laughing, it's not funny. If the other person is not laughing with you, it's not funny. You may find it funny, but it's not funny. Because being funny is about what? About having all people laugh together. About putting a smile on everybody's face. But we think it's funny. And you know what happens? Sometimes we make people hate the sunnah or hate the deen because of our actions. In the name of Islam, we can be so rude. In the name of Islam, we yell at people. In the name of Islam, demoralize people. In the name of Islam, we crush the spirits of people. That is not the case, brothers and sisters. A Muslim is supposed to be considerate. How you drive, it says a lot about you. Where you park your car, it says a lot about you. The way, there's so many things. We are constantly displaying our character. Constantly we are displaying our character. So the point is, be considered. The Prophet ﷺ would say, if you eat garlic or if you eat um, onions, say, don't come to the masjid. If you plan to come to the masjid, say, avoid these things. Why? I'm coming to the house of Allah. Yes, but the house of Allah is full of other believers. And you know what? Eating garlic or eating onions is very inconsiderate of you. So when you come, make sure that you impact the, the people that are around you nicely. Make sure that your presence brings joy. Make sure that people around you can feel that, you know what, this person is so considerate, they will neither say, nor will they do anything that will hurt my feelings. Be considerate. Be conscious. Be compassionate. And be considerate. The fourth C is courage. Have courage. Have courage about what? What is it? It is about us being able to stand up for what we believe. It is about the ability to stand up for the principles and the values that we hold. We say you are a person of courage when you are challenged, yet you stand up for your beliefs and you stand up for your principles and you stand up for your values. Courage is so needed nowadays. The Prophet ﷺ would speak about courage. You know, Musa alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran. But interestingly, every time Musa alayhi salam is mentioned, he's always afraid. Musa alayhi salam is afraid. The staff turns into a serpent, he's afraid to pick it up. He's told to go to Pharaoh and he is afraid of Allah. You know, Pharaoh is a very tyrant man, he is afraid. Can we say that Musa alayhi salam is a coward? Absolutely not. Because courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what is right despite the existence of the fear. Musa alayhi salam was afraid, but his, his fear did not stop him from doing that which is right. Courage is needed especially when we have to challenge social status quo. Sometimes some of the social traditions that we have are very oppressive to some people, to some groups, but it takes courage to come and speak against this. The Arabs did not allow women to inherit. 
it took so much social courage for the Prophet وسلم, to come and address such an issue. And people would, you know, they were an uproar about this. We do not have this in our forefathers. Our forefathers never did that. And that is not acceptable. But it takes courage. It takes courage to speak truth to power. In the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, says, He said, do not let your fear of people stop you from saying that which is right. And the Prophet ﷺ would empower us to make sure that you have the courage. You have what it takes to bring about a change. And then conscience, compassion, consideration, and courage. And now we have control. A person of character is a person of control. Ability to control our desires. Ability to control our rages. Ability to control and be able to abstain and hold back. That is so much needed. Many times we want to lash out at people. Many times we want to express ourselves in a negative way. So the Prophet ﷺ would teach us, He asked people, you know, who is the strong person amongst you? Or what is your definition of strength? So people said, Prophet of Allah, a strong man is the man who is able to wrestle people down. They're able to wrestle them down. So the Prophet ﷺ said, ليس القوي بالسرعة. He said that strength is not determined by the ability to wrestle people down. He said, إنما القوي من يملك نفسه عند الغضب. He said, truly a strong person is the one who is able to get a hold of himself when he is most angry. That is strength. That is power. He said, if you're able to do this, you are a strong person. Sometimes we have urges. Sometimes we have needs. And we look into it. You want to steal. But then there is that conscious and that control and that power to say, no, I will not do this. I will hold back. So this idea of control, the idea of milk and nafs, that you are in charge over your desires and not having your desires being in charge over you, that is not acceptable. So there is this concept of control. And then the final one, we said conscience, compassion, consideration, courage, and control. And the last one is confidence. Confidence in what? Many times doing what is right, we cannot see the result immediately. And sometimes we doubt it. So we say, be confident. You need to do the right thing all the time. Whether you reap the value, whether you reap the benefit, whether you see the result is irrelevant. Do what is right. Be confident that what is right needs to be done all the time, no exception. And then if you see the result, Alhamdulillah. If you do not see the result, then it was actually to begin with doing the right thing that was most important. So be confident. And that is why people who do the right because the right is right are never disappointed. They're never disappointed. Let me demonstrate with a story. They said that one time, this man was given an, an, a surprise bonus by his boss, uh, by the supervisor in the company that he works for. One day the company decided that they're going to give a thousand dollars bonus to the people. And when people have money and it was not expected, it feels good. Feels good. You go there and you have your own plans. I will do this and I will buy this. So this man gets the thousand dollars in his hands and he is thinking to himself, I am going to buy this and my wife is going to be very happy with this and I will buy my children this and I will buy them that. So he is dreaming about how to spend the thousand dollars. On the way, he was approached by a woman. She was holding a young baby in her hands and she was crying. And she said, sir, my baby is dying. I need help. I cannot afford to buy any medication for my baby. My baby is dying. And the man was so moved by this woman and this scene of the baby about to die that he put his hands in his pocket and he gave her all thousand dollars. He went home and he told the story to his family. You know, the boss gave me a thousand dollars today, the supervisor. And on the way, I found out that, you know, there was this woman and she came to me and she begged me and her baby was dying and I gave her this money. 
So the family looked at him and they said, Dad or father, you have been fooled. They said, you have been fooled. Somebody has fooled you. And they were laughing at him. His children said, Father, idiot, you've been fooled. This woman played a trick on you. You've been had. So he was very upset to the reaction of his family. And as they're watching the news, one part of the news came in and that is a woman was caught today by the police scheming people out of money, holding a baby saying that the baby is dying and the baby is not dying and this woman was fooling people. So the family looked at him and they said, see, we told you, you have been fooled. The woman has fooled you. And the father looked at them and he said, this is the best news I have heard. And they said, what are you talking about? Somebody just stole a thousand dollars from you and you're telling us that uh, this is the best news that you have heard. He said, don't you get it? The baby is not dying. The baby is not dying. He said, this is really what matters. The baby is not dying. I gave the thousand dollars because I wanted the baby not to die. And if I got the news that the baby is not dying, then this is the best news that I have heard of the day. See, brothers and sisters, we can speak so much Islam this and Islam that. But the beauty of Islam is when Islam is implemented. We can say all the nice things that we want. But by the end of the day, it is not about what we say, but wallahi, it really is about what we do. Let me conclude by this by this story. Because believe it or not, any time, any day, we are constantly giving people clues about who we are. We are constantly displaying what kind of character we hold. So one day, this man was driving a very nice car. Maybe some of you have heard the story before. It's a very, very beautiful story. He parked his car. And then when he came out from his house or from wherever he was, he found this young boy walking around his car. He was admiring the car. What a beautiful car. And he was talking to the car. Wow, this is really beautiful. This is really nice. And he was touching the car and massaging the car. And this is a beautiful car. And look at the lights and look at this. And so the man, the owner of the car came out and he said, you like it, son? And he said, sir, I love it. This is the most beautiful car I have ever seen. So the old man said, my brother gave it to me as a gift. So the young boy immediately said, Sir, I wish I can be like your brother. He said, I wish I can be like your brother. He did not say, I wish I can have a brother like you. Isn't that what we would say? We would all have said, I wish I had a brother like you. But what does he choose to say? I wish I was like your brother. That is what we call a beautiful display of character. Character is important, brothers and sisters. We must have conscience, compassion, consideration, control, confidence, and courage. Hada wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah, brother Yasser for your excellent presentation. It was certainly a timely awakening for Muslims, because as we say, it is your character, and based on your character, how we behave, we make the presentation of what Islam is. Alhamdulillah, we have learned a lot from this talk. Now we would have the open question answer session. There are three mics in the auditorium, one in the front, one in the rear on my right for the brothers and one on the left in the rear for the sisters. We request our questioners to kindly line up at the mics to put forward their questions. We would allow the first question from the mic in the ladies section. Kindly keep your questions on the topic, make it brief and you may ask only one question at a time. Non-Muslims of course would be given preference over Muslims to put forward their questions. Volunteers may kindly allow them to do so. Yes, sister. Jazakallah for your wonderful talk. 
you spoke of two Cs that I find very confusing sometimes. One is courage and the other is compassion. Sometimes the people we love do not want to hear the right things that we say and they get hurt. Which C should be given preference at that time? Courage or compassion? That is an excellent question. And usually, as speakers, you appreciate a question that indicates that somebody has really been following what you're talking about. You may not have an answer to the question, but nevertheless, you appreciate the question um, itself. Which C do you give preference to? When it comes to dealing with those who are around us, I like to say that there are four principles that ought to guide us. Number one, four principles when we are dealing with our loved ones. Principle number one, the person is more important than the point. Many times we put so much emphasis at the point that we end up losing the person. What good is the point if you lost the person? So what we want to do is we want to delay making the point, but save the person. Save the person. The person is more important than the point. Secondly, being kind is more important than being right. Sometimes we feel that because I am right, that's it. No, it's not necessarily that way. Because in the process, as you are right, it does not mean that you are not kind. But rather, you are also kind in the process. So the person is more important than the point. Being kind is more important than being right. And then also with our loved ones, mean what you say and say what you mean. Mean what you say and say what you mean. I will go down here right now and some of you will come and they will shake my hands and they will say, MashaAllah, this was a beautiful presentation. But deep in your heart, you think it stinks. You may think it was not good, but yet you come and you shake my hand. MashaAllah, that was very good. You said it, but you don't mean it. And what you really mean, it was never said. So say what you mean and mean what you say. And sometimes when we deal with our loved ones, we tend to be harsh on them. That is not acceptable. I remember one time after the Eid khutbah, we said, please, when you go out after Eid, after the khutbah, we said, please hug your family, embrace your family members. So this young girl, 19 year old girl, she came after the salah and she came to the Imam and she said, Imam, I just want to say thank you for making this announcement. I am 19 years old. I don't ever remember my father ever hugging me before today. She said, I don't ever remember, ever, my father ever give me a hug or embrace me and I am 19 before today. So when you made the announcement, in response to the announcement, he came and he, and he hugged me. If it is an issue about principle, then courage comes first. And if it is an issue that is personally, you know, related to me personally, then I would say compassion goes first. When it's an issue of principle, there is no compromise. I'll be nice, I'll be kind, but there will be no compromise, and that takes courage. But if it is an issue that is related to me, it is something that is personal, I say compassionate takes precedent over the other seas. Allahu alam, Allah knows best. May we have uh, questions along with the name and profession so we get a more appropriate response. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abdul Hamid. I am from Nasik. I am in a government job. I want to ask you a question, Brother Yasser. Today, people in the world with power, like political power and uh, ammunition power and everything, they are pushing Muslim peoples in Qital. So what is your comment with pretext to or context to with your fifth C that is control? What are your comments, please? It is something that is happening, unfortunately. But by the end of the day, remember this. And I believe we spoke about this some time ago. Sometimes these are issues of character. Equally as important as character is our attitude, especially the way we see life. Because the way you see life is going to determine how you live life. Part of our, our attitude also is the way we understand Islam and what we think Islam is. 
Because many times Islam is not necessarily what we think Islam is. For example, I cannot comprehend somebody claiming to be a Sunni going into a mosque because these people are Shias and going there as a suicide bomber and exploding himself there. And when you ask, why do you do this? Say, why do you ask? They're Shias. And the same thing a Shia person coming into a Sunni mosque and they explode themselves and say, but why is this? They're Sunnis, all done in the name of Islam. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. I say, but why are you doing this to each other? Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, لا ترجعوا بعضي كفارة Do not apostate after me, do not reject faith after I am gone by smiting the necks of one another. We do this and we do it in the name of Islam. How can you do this? What happened to your conscience? How can you kill an innocent soul? If that soul is kafir, if that soul is anything, if it's wicked, anything, you just do not take away a life. So at that point, your conscience is dead. Your compassion is gone. You definitely have no control. Your courage is actually foolishness. Because when you do this, it does not, it does not mean that you are brave, but rather you are a fool. And we must believe this, that it takes a foolish person to do this. It does not take a brave person to do that. Brothers, this is an important point. It does not take a brave person to do this. It takes a fool to do this. And we must believe it. So the person that you're talking about or what is going on is very sad. It is disgraceful and it's despicable. And it is done in the name of Islam. And we say we reject these notions. We have our differences, but you don't solve them in this way. You don't solve them by going to somebody's masjid and blowing up the masjid. That does not do it. That is silly. You must be sick in your head to be thinking this way. And that is not acceptable. So the point is, to me, this is not just one C. It's not about control of not being able to pull the trigger or pull the trigger or not. And that to me, that it's not about control. It's the whole attitude. It's the whole mentality. The whole vision and perspective that people have about what Islam is. Not acceptable. So to me, it's not really just one sea, it's every sea that is out there. They are involved of it. Diminished and defined and def total deficiency in all the seas. But sometimes what's bothersome is this. We seem to protest when non-Muslims do things to Muslims. However, when Muslims do things to Muslims, we're very quiet. Why don't we protest that as well? Why don't we show the same anger with our own fellow Muslims when they wrong other Muslims? Why are we only angry when it is the non-Muslims do the same things that Muslims do to each other, yet we're angry when the non-Muslims do it to the Muslims? Why? Why is this? Not acceptable. So the point is, it is not one sea, but rather it is all the seas. And then if we believe this, then we must speak against it. What good is this opinion of mine if I'm not able to share it with my brothers and sisters? You're welcome to disagree with me, but I must make my... It takes courage to come out and say what I see going on is wrong. And we must speak about it. And we must address it and we must empower each other by saying this is wrong and it is not acceptable. It cannot be taken place in the name of Islam. It cannot. And we must reject these notions and we say that we must bring in that peaceful beautiful face of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember the first time I came here, I told the story of two businessmen. Uh, they were having shops next to one another. One of them sells vinegar and the other one sells candy. And the businessman that was selling candy, his business was absolutely terrible. People walk in and out of his shop, they don't buy anything. The people that sold vinegar, his business was booming. People walk in and they walk out with gallons of vinegar. And so six months down the road, the person decided to close down the candy shop because his business was really bad. But then he said, I must go and inquire of this person. He sells vinegar and his business is better than my candy business. So he went to him and he said, sir, I don't mean to offend you, but I sell candy. It tastes very sweet and it smells very good. You sell vinegar, it tastes very bitter and it smells very nasty. Yet your business is better than my business. How come? So the man looked at him and he said, Sir, you sell candy with a vinegary face. I sell vinegar with a candy face. Okay. 
It is not the fault of the product. It is not the fault of the candy. It was the fault of the person that was selling the candy. It was not the sweetness of the vinegar, but it was the seller of the vinegar that was sweet, and he was able to sell that product. So we have got this beautiful product called Islam. Are we using a candy face to sell it? We're always angry. We're always offended. We're always provoked. We're always mad about something. We're always fighting. We're always... Why would anybody consider this? And somebody else is selling their vinegar, but they're selling it with a very candy face. So we say, let us assess and reassess this beautiful product of Islam and let us put that face that is most appropriate to it. Allahu A'lam. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Muzammil Sheikh and I'm a management student. Sir, as you correctly mentioned all the six C's, in management we have been taught all the six C's are included. But don't you think that consistency and courtesy too includes? What is your comment about? Jazakallah khair. The brother is adding another C's, consistency and um, courtesy. Yes. Part of courtesy, of course, is being considerate. Because being courteous, you know, is being able to extend a helping hand, being um, these universal values to share with other people, you're being courteous. So similar to courtesy is being considerate. As far as consistency, we said at the very beginning, having a good character is not a goal, it's a process. And because it's a process, one of the requirements of having it to begin with is a consistency and the dedication and the commitment to the, to the idea of, of character. But remember one thing, brothers and sisters, we're not saying that you only need these six C's. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that these are essential components of having a good character. So there are many other characters. Some of them, they can be subdivisions of this. For example, generosity. Generosity comes under compassion because we are moved by what we feel. So we start spending and, um, and what have you. So these are not you know, the only C's that are out there. But these are just a way of starting the idea, beginning the dialogue of what is needed to have a good character. But thank you for bringing that up. Jazakallah khair. Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to ask one question that sometimes we find that things we advise to others are not found in us. So can we advise some? someone or we should first improve ourselves that's a good question that's a very good question and thank you for bringing up this this question many people say i don't advise people because simply i myself have not done it so because i am not doing it i cannot advise people of it otherwise it's going to make me a hypocrite and i do not want to be a hypocrite so let's all just be quiet about it this approach is not acceptable one time i read the statement by ibn taymiyyah and i found to be you know um, i i was not comfortable with it because i did not understand it at that time and he said he said that it is advisable for those people who are consuming intoxicants to tell each other to stop drinking imagine this they are drinking and he said you should still tell each other, even though you are drinking, he said that you should tell each other to stop drinking. And I read that statement and I said, hmm, this really does not make sense. You're already drinking, what do you mean you tell each other not to start drinking? And then I meet a brother, a Mexican brother in the US. And I said, so you accepted Islam, what happened? He said, one day, I had a Muslim friend and he said, and we were all drinking alcohol. Everybody had the bottle of wine and we were drinking it. And then he said he was drinking it and he said, man, I shouldn't really be drinking this. I am a Muslim. Muslims are not supposed to drink alcohol. And he finishes the bottle. So the man looked at him and he said, what are you talking about? You mean there is a religion that actually forbids drinking alcohol? He said, my religion, man, my religion, Islam, we are forbidden to consume alcohol. He said, I need to check this religion out. The Mexican brother goes and studies Islam, becomes a Muslim, and then he comes and he saves this Muslim brother as well. Okay. Where, why is this happening? Simply because sometimes I may be engaged in the wrong, and I may be weak, 
But because I am engaged in it, it does not mean that I should stop from telling people, you know, about how wrong it is. And sometimes I do want to encourage people to do good. But I myself, I am not involved in that good. On my part, that is not good. But it, collectively speaking, as a community, we must always be addressing these issues. We must always be addressing these issues. I don't pray at night, but it's okay for me to come and tell people. I should do it myself first, but I can come and tell people, please people, do this. This is good. We have to promote the good irrespective of whether we ourselves are doing it or not. And we have to discourage the evil regardless whether we are involved in it or we are not. That part of it is a given. But then on the individual level, we must also pay attention that we do not become hypocritical in the process. That I advise people, oh, you can't be doing this, but yet I self, I am engaged in it. And that is why in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, يَأْتِ النَّاسُ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ بِحَسَنَاتٍ كَجِبَالِ تِهَامَ I said on the day of judgment, people are going to come, you know, taking loads of hasanat with them, like the mountains of tihama, you no know, lots of reward. And then he said, فَيَجْعَلُهَا اللَّهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it and will turn it into scattered ashes. And the companion said, why is this prophet of Allah? He said, these are the people that were enjoying the good, yet they never did it. And they were forbidding the evil, yet they were engaged in it. The hadith is not telling you to stop. The hadith is not telling you to stop, the peop to stop telling people from it. But the hadith is telling you to stop being engaged in the evil as you are forbidding the evil. This is what the hadith is stopping you to do. Stop from being engaged in the evil as you are speaking against it. And start encouraging the good as you yourself, you are embarked, embarked on it. So I say, do talk to people, but also make sure that you listen to yourself first. Yeah. Yes, brother, that would be the last question of the session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Abdul Rahman. I am a student of engineering. Brother Yasser, I would like to ask a question to you. Uh, today we are seeing in our country, majority people uh, present in our India, most, mostly, uh, they are watching uh, TV serials too much. They are addicted to these serials like anything. And I think that this is a careful and a very appropriate strategy or plan of uh, uh, Yahudis which has been developed to engage Muslims in these uh, serials. And because of this, we can see that our youngsters, both uh, male and female, they are getting uh, involved in these uh, bad activities. And because of this, there, uh, we see moral degradation in our society. What alternatives uh, would you suggest to our audience, to us, uh, to stop these evils in our society, please? Do me a favor. And, and, and please do listen to this part carefully. I personally do not agree with conspiracy theory. We Muslims think that everything that is happening to us is because of the Yahud. If an earthquake happens in Turkey, oh my God, the Yahud must have shaken the earth down there. Akhi, it does not happen this way. We cannot go and blame others for our own failures. We are failures because we have failed. We have failed because we are not abiding by our own principles. If somebody comes and takes advantage of this, then they are only pursuing their own self-interest. But we cannot blame somebody else for our own failure. So I disregard with this notion that, you know, this is happening because it's a Yahudi plan or it's a Zionist plan. No, it's just our own fault. Why did you fail in the exam? Because you did not study. It's not that because some Yahudi did not want me to pass the exam. You just did not study, that's why you failed. So to me, to begin with, let us stop this notion of trying to find somebody to blame. Even, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, they take 90% of the blame, let us work on our 10% of the blame. Otherwise, we're constantly pointing fingers to somewhere here and somewhere there, and that is not acceptable, brother. That is not acceptable. As far as media is concerned, it is there, it's a reality. And by the way, it is very easy to say this is haram. But it does not take you know, much effort to declare something haram. That's not a big deal. What a big deal is to say this is haram and I have an alternative. 
I have an alternative that is as exciting. I have an alternative that is as entertaining. I have an alternative that is as informative. I have an alternative that is as captivating. I have an alternative for you. Islam says don't deal with interest, but all other transactions are halal. Do not consume intoxicants, you can have this juice. So the big deal is not in saying that this is haram. The real big deal and the real challenge is in finding an alternative. You tell your children, watching TV is haram. Okay, fine, haram. But we're kids, what do we do? What do you want us to do? Listening to Yasser Fazaga is not entertaining. Who put on that, but that's not, I am, I'm just a child. You know, don't put this man on my face. I want to play, I want to be entertained. So the challenge is we recognize the evil that is out there. What kind of an alternative are we bringing? And for this we say, this is not a one man show, but rather this is a collective effort. It's a collective effort where we need all the talents in our community, where we need all the skills of our community to facilitate and to come in as families, concerned parents, concerned mothers, concerned fathers. We say, you know what? When our children are at home and they put on that TV, the things that they see on TV are not very good. We will turn off the TV, but what are the other alternatives? What other alternatives are we providing for them? And to be honest with you, wallah, I don't have an answer. But it's a challenge for all sane, decent, reasonable people all over the world. Television is becoming extremely evil. You know, to put it mildly, to say the least about it. But the question is, what is the alternative that we are suggesting in replacement? And I say that, let us promote an Islamic medium. Let us promote a media. See, TV is not really haram. TV is a tool. What you do with it determines whether it's haram or not. So TV in itself is nothing. It's like a knife. You can either cut tomatoes with it or you can kill people with it. So we don't say that, you know, the knife is haram. You say what you do with the knife determines whether it's haram or not. It's a beautiful tool. TV is an amazing, amazing, you know, um, uh, invention of humanity nowadays. But we have misused it. It can be beautiful and it can be very entertaining and very informative. So we say, let us use that tool and let us facilitate it for the betterment of humanity. Let me give you an example. The Mormon church in the U.S. Very, you know, they're part of the Christian faith. And what they do is this. All the movies that come out, they literally take it and they filter it. They absolutely filter it. They take all bad scenes, all profanities, everything out of it, and then they rent it out to their church members. We want you to be entertained, but we don't want your entertainment to be based on filth. We want you entertained, but we don't want you to be insulted in the process. And we say nowadays, let us encourage Islamic media. Let us encourage people who are studying, going towards these studies, so that they can take these beautiful Islamic, you know, Islamic ideas, can reach Islam. You know, in here, we only speak to a number of people. But subhanAllah, now that there is TV and there is satellite and the world is becoming such a small village, we can communicate with humanity better if we are able to facilitate this idea of television better, insha'Allah. Uh, with this, I want to say again, Jazakumullah khair, thank you very much. Hada wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashadu Allah ilaha. Jazakallah khair, brother Yasir Fazaga, for your great seed that stands for contribution to raising up the levels of the six seas of character before our audience present here as well as the millions who may inshallah watch you on television and uh, inshallah that would be the milestone in a greater growth of our ummah in future inshallah we uh, i would request our own brothers to kindly appreciate brother yasir allahu akbar for his great contribution to raising up our level we thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making the program possible for us and we are thankful for our brothers and sisters to be present here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.